Um, I couldn't find the actual uh, first copy, but I found a copy of, of Black A Anthology, In the Life, edited by Joe Beam. What year is In the Life published? Uh, 86. It had to be 86 because Joe wrote in my book, If You Can't Dance, What Kind of Revolution Is It? Joseph Bean, 121086. Mm. He wrote wow. that to, 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 it to George. In the Life, an anthology of Black gay writing. And now feels like a darkly ironic name for Joseph Beam's anthology, which is a foundational text in the Black queer arts movement of that era. Because so much of 1986 in that community was actually about death. So George uh, Bellinger Jr. is one of the frankly few people in that scene who lived to tell about it. I was a dancer. I went to fashion school and I had uh, a little BA in education. <laughs> but I was a dancer, choreographer teaching dance. His best friend was a notable writer named Craig G. Harris. And he wrote for this anthology, In the Life. He contributed a poem that offers a real snapshot of 1986. I asked George to dig out his old copy of the book and read Craig's poem. It's called Cut Off from Among Their People. This poem talks about a family going to a funeral of a son who died of AIDS and how they respond to it. The mother was radiant a two composed. She wore a black on black silk dress, which tied at the neck with a large bow and ended below the knee in a wide knife pleats. Her salt and pepper hair pulled onto a... The poem goes on to describe the whole family's insistent, cold dignity in this kind of detail until arriving at the deceased's lover. Jeff unconsciously reached out to touch the pewter casket, but was intercepted by the mother. She whisked her hand away from the freezing politeness and said, he's gone now. It was the same tone she used when she first The same freezing tone she'd used when Jeff told her the man they both loved was dying of AIDS. The same she gave him when they met for the first time at his hospital deathbed. The family had explicitly requested that no flowers be sent. Jeff had ignored that request and sent a lavender flowers, which had always been his lover's favorite. He had not been allowed to assist in any of the burial plans. He had been told quite diplomatically by his lover's sister that the family could not be so insensitive as to accept his generous offer. A final, polite rejection. They would arrange for the funeral and interment and notify him of the details. That kind of sums up how we address HIV in our community. That a lot of us who were lovers or good friends were dismissed to the side. And when funerals took place, we were not included. And... Craig did not want that for his life. When his funeral happened, the arrangements included many of us. He created community. And he lived in a community, and he died with community. Craig Harris died four years after he published this poem, at age 33. And in those four years, he helped his community shift from mourning death to fighting for life. Gil Gerald, the activist who was living in D.C., who we met back in episode one, he remembers a catalytic moment for that shift. It was also 1986. So it was a conference of the uh, American Public Health Association, it was their national convention, and it was being held in Las Vegas. Our next speaker who will discuss... A hugely important gathering for a hugely important group in national health care. We have a very distinguished panel today that will... It's thousands of people that come to this conference. You know, people 
across the spectrum of disciplines uh, dealing with uh, public health and health. We're talking about a big, huge conference. Can you hear now in the back? Thank you. And they were going to dedicate a marquee conversation at the end of the event to discussing AIDS. Gil, he got the importance of this. He'd been sounding the alarm about AIDS in the community for years at this point. So he and a bunch of queer activists decided to meet up there, including Craig Harris. Earlier in the day, we had gone and as a group and gone to a meeting of the National Black Nurses Association. And there was a general feeling that we weren't taken seriously. This is not our issue. So but Craig was pissed. He was really pissed. Pleasure to call to all of this closing general session. And when the big aid session itself finally came, they did not see themselves represented on the panel. After sitting through many speakers and over an hour of talking, Craig rushed the stage with a number of other people and he grabbed the microphone. Good morning. My name is Craig Harris as the interim chair of the National Minority AIDS Council. He got to the stage and um, he was already up the steps before people were like, like, who is this man and why are you going up the stairs? We'll be glad to let you, glad, be glad to let him talk for a minute so that we will have a chance to complete our... Thoughts. And Craig Harris gave this calm, polite presentation explaining that contrary to popular belief, this epidemic was rapidly becoming uniquely intense among people of color and they were dying because they have been led to believe by the public health system and all forms of media to believe that people of color are not suffering from AIDS in significant numbers. In reality, almost 40% of people diagnosed with AIDS in the country at that very moment were either Black or Latino. And he told them, maybe you'd notice this disparity if you let us speak more often. Please remember that as you are victims of a society which is institutionally racist, heterosexist, and classist, you may benefit from the experience and input of your Black, Latino, and Asian peers who are on the front line fighting inadequate health care for our communities. Thank you very much. I'm Kai Wright. This is Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows from the History Channel and WNYC. Of all the people living with HIV in the United States today, 40% of them are still Black. That's a wildly disproportionate share of this epidemic. It's an imbalance that developed right at the start and grew steadily year after year. In 1986, Craig Harris and Gil Gerald and George Bellinger and a tight-knit group of gay men in Black cities all around the country launched a movement in response to this fact. Their movement required them to confront big, important institutions like the American Public Health Association. And it meant they had to stare down racism in the broader LGBT community. But perhaps their most pressing and consequential challenge It's also kind of the most difficult one to name. It's the one that angered Craig Harris so much when he met the Black nurses, the one he lyrically described in his poem for In the Life. They had to deal with the rejection of their own community. Because when the AIDS epidemic struck, a Black community that had spent generations learning to take care of ourselves through all of the horrors we had already overcome in American history simply shrunk back from this particular threat. Why? It's not only that we're not responding. um, You know, there's a dismissal of the impact of this on Black communities. Kathy Cohen is a political scientist at the University of Chicago, and in the late 1990s, she published a definitive study of the Black community's response to the epidemic. It had been her dissertation because she, like Craig Harris and George Bellinger, was a queer Black person living in New York during that pivotal time in the late 80s. You know, we saw the emergence of ACT UP, and that looked like a predominantly white, gay organization that was demanding attention. But I didn't see a similar response in the Black community. And I could point to the civil rights movement before and beyond, 
as moments of kind of collective resistance on the part of Black people. But I was like, what, what is happening here? In this episode, we take up Kathy's question, what was happening in the Black community? We'll try to answer it by delving into one neighborhood, the world just outside the walls of Harlem Hospital, where we spent time back in episode two. Harlem has been a global center of Black culture and politics for over a century. So I talked to a guy who maybe knows its politics better than anybody alive today. I'm David A. Patterson, a recovering governor. (laughs) And... uh, Happy to be here. New York's first Black governor and a scion of Harlem's political elite. His father was one of the most influential political players in all of New York for much of the 20th century. And it's from that vantage that David Patterson watched the AIDS epidemic unfold. Governor Patterson, do you remember the first time you heard of AIDS? I actually do. It was in the morning. I was listening to the morning news And they said that uh, there had been a death that was attributed to the AIDS virus. And I'd never heard of the AIDS virus. And um, I think I went to work and someone, you know, in a conversation said to me, no, this is very serious. And the fear is that it might get around. But to understand Black Harlem's response, you can't start with HIV and AIDS. You got to first understand the mindset among the most civically engaged people in the community at the time that the virus began to spread. What what did people care about? Homelessness. That was a big issue. And service dumping, like taking all the, you know, agencies that you don't want in your neighborhood and putting them in Harlem. And a sewage treatment plant that had been pushed all up the west side and landed in Harlem because... The community didn't have the political might to stop it. In short, they wanted respect. They were tired of being treated like a ghetto. Many residents were strivers and considered themselves upstanding citizens, and they wanted to be treated as such by their government. And frankly, people had chips on their shoulders about this. Governor Patterson is kind of famous for how much he enjoys dishing about the eccentricities of political life. And he's got this story from his own initiation into Harlem politics that gives you a sense of the vibe at the time. Now this is priceless. <laughs> it was 1985, and he had signed up to help raise money for David Dinkins, who was running to become Manhattan's borough president. Dinkins would, of course, go on to make history as the city's first Black mayor later in the 80s. But Patterson remembers an event during that 1985 campaign. They had to meet with a particularly cantankerous neighborhood club. Harlem, something rather club. And nobody wanted to go. So they sent me, who was the fundraiser. <laughs> so I don't know what the issues are in this campaign, but I go up there and, I mean, everything I said to them was wrong. You know, they said, what's the day that comes after Tuesday? And I said, Wednesday? They'd say, what makes you think you could come in here and say a thing like that? You know? <laughs> they were just ridiculous. The subtext here is important. The people in this club wanted respect from the city and its leaders. And the fact that David Dinkins sent a young David Patterson to talk for him instead of showing up himself was plain disrespectful. But as Patterson's leaving the stage, an older woman chimes in with one last point. Sitting in the first row, who had beaten me down three times, goes, I have one more question. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, I'm dead. Why do we have to burn the body, you know? She tells him, I'm not going to be for deacons. I'm disgusted that he sent you instead of showing up himself, but... But I'm going to tell you something, young man. I like the way you sat there and answered the questions, and you were clearly being insulted at times, but you just kept giving the answers. That's the kind of temperament that I'm looking for in an elected Mm -hmm. official. And three weeks later, the state senator, Leon Bogues, passed away. It was kind of unexpected. And... um, the late Percy Sutton called me up and said, you know, if I were you, I'd run for that office. And I said, you know, I, I have to go back and take the bar exam. And he says to me, and he had a distinct way of talking. He said, by the time you complete the bar exam, the position will no longer be available. <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe this? Yeah. So I run. 
And this is how, in 1985, David Patterson began serving as Harlem's gregarious state senator, an office he would hold for more than 20 years. He understood something important about his constituents. The people who were doing the most to keep the community's institutions alive were sensitive about how the rest of the city saw them and their neighborhood. And that sensitivity about respect, it was directed at power brokers, yes, but not only at them. The Black community, I think, is misunderstood in other parts of the city and even other parts of the country. The Black community is largely conservative, church-going, family building. And intensely ambitious. I think there were people who, you know, they worked hard. They were starting to get to places. And they, at times, probably felt that there was a responsibility in the community that was holding them back. In AIDS, it was still very much considered an epidemic of irresponsible people with no self-respect, promiscuous gay men and drug users. And as Kathy Cohen has observed, this was a central issue for the Black middle class. I think it goes back to this question of who we understand as deserving and who we want to center our politics around. For Patterson, it was a couple of years into his tenure as Harlem State Senator when he noticed something wasn't quite right in the community's narrative about this. I read in the New York Times that the prevalence of AIDS in the Black community had now usurped the gay community. It was 1987, just a year after Craig Harris stormed that stage at the public health conference. He and a bunch of other queer activists had created the National Minority AIDS Council, among other new groups that focused on the Black epidemic. And this was all as a way to engage Black leaders like David Patterson. And around that time the Manhattan Cable Television would give each of the legislators a show but per year. So you got to do one show for the year. So I decided to do my show on the AIDS crisis and how there didn't seem to be any response from the leadership in the Black community. But when he earnestly hit up all the usual suspects to come on TV and talk with him about it, he got a rude surprise. Um... Nobody wanted to come on. (laughs) And usually, you know, being on TV, even if it's a cable show, you know, there were plenty of people. (laughs) Then when they found out what I wanted to talk about, they didn't want to do it. But he got it booked, and he had the conversation, and his office phone started blowing up from other parts of the city. Gay and AIDS activists who were like, yeah, man, join the fight, let's go. But in Harlem itself, amongst your constituents in Harlem, how did they react? I think the constituents in Harlem were like, you know, you're probably right. We're not going to cheer for you, but we're not going to bother you. Which, frankly, was a victory because there was one very important constituency in Harlem and in many Black neighborhoods that actively discouraged any conversation about AIDS or the irresponsible people who it was most visibly killing. Let me just say, the first issue that we had was the resistance of the Black clergy to get involved because, you know, two-thirds of them thought, well, you know, it's a sin, and that's what happens to sinners. You know, God hates homosexuals, or God hates you because you, you know, doing drugs, or this is a raft of God, or some whatever negative, destructive messaging that they got most times... They got it from the pulpit, the most influential place in our community. Coming up, one woman's crusade to convince Black clergy that they had to lead, follow, or get out of the damn way. My work with the church was not only my comfort zone, but it was where I was able to release doing something about the situation. That's next. Heads up that there is a mention of suicide coming up in this part of the episode, so please take care. 
And a reminder that you can always find help for you or your loved one by dialing 988 for the National Lifeline. That's 988 to get help. Pernessa Seal is today something of a celebrity in Black church circles. But back in the late 1980s, she was a naive, kind of out-of-place newbie in Harlem, working at Harlem Hospital, collecting epidemiological data on AIDS. This was before AZT. So this was really in the beginning of, this was the what do we do time, you know, what... She'd come up from Lincolnville, South Carolina, and her faith was a big part of her life. But she didn't know a thing about New York, so she ended up going to church way out in Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Truth Center. And I had a little idea then to have a cultural arts institute. I was always having little ideas. So she searched the city for special people to help out. And one of those people I found was Lionel Stubblefield, who was a great baritone who lived in Harlem. Lionel agreed to lend a hand, and before he knew it, he was also the church's music director. Pernessa has that effect on people. You always kind of do more than you think you're gonna. Lionel and I became real good friends. We both lived in Manhattan, and he would get a car service to Brooklyn, and he just really taught me a whole nother way that I could actually get a a limousine service to church (laughs) on a Sunday morning, you know? We weren't just catching the train, you know? But one day, all of a sudden, something about her friend changed. Lionel just started losing a lot of weight quickly. And one one Thursday evening uh, for choir practice, he did not come. He did not show up. And a group of uh, choir members went to, up to his place uh, up on 100-and-something-something street to see about him that night and found him uh, slumped over in his chair. Uh, he had passed away. And then I had a violin teacher called me up one night and said, uh, Perness, I heard that Lionel died of AIDS. And I was like, well, I think so. He said, I'm going to tell you, if I, if I ever get that, I'm just going to kill myself. I'm just going to kill myself. And, um, and guess what? A couple of months later, he went to the roof of his building and jumped and killed himself. Pernessa also witnessed the growing horror of the epidemic through her work at Harlem Hospital, meeting patients who had AIDS. My work took me on the floor, and um, and people wanted to be, they wanted to be visited. They wanted someone to pray with them. They wanted someone to hold their hand. And, and I'm like, where's the church? Because I'm looking at the church that I grew up in in Lincolnville. When you're sick, you know, mama and the pastor and them, they go, they rush into the hospital. And that was just not happening. Vanessa Seal was a social worker at Harlem Hospital with me. She worked at Harlem Hospital with me. You know, we worked in the same program together, so we knew each other. She was my buddy back in the days. <laughs> Maxine Frere is the pediatric nurse from Harlem Hospital, who we met back in episode two. Like Vanessa, faith is a huge part of Maxine's life. So I met her in the basement room of her church, one of Harlem's most historic congregations, First AME Church Bethel. There's a choir room, so we dress and we heard. Since she was a kid, Maxine's been deeply involved in the place, and she began trying to build an AIDS ministry there early in the epidemic. She remembers the first time she tried to hold meetings after Sunday service to just talk about who in the church needed help. People didn't come. So what I did was, um, there was a bulletin board up here, and I put a sky, and I had a lot of stars, and so I told people to confidentially, if they, wanted to, if they knew anybody with HIV or wanted to pray or put a star on the bulletin board. So the next week I came down, it was full. Wow. <laughs> it was full of stars. So they didn't want to talk about it, but they had people who were infected or affected by HIV. It was an insult, you know. If you were, you know, the stigma of being HIV positive was that you were a drug addict, right? Mm-hmm. If you weren't a drug addict, then how did you get HIV? You were gay. <laughs> you were gay. 
And if you weren't gay, what, you're a prostitute, a, a drug addict, or something like that. And so that meant you, your whole family was a disgrace. People in church were supposed to be perfect, you know, saved and never doing anything wrong or never did anything wrong. But, well, you know, you're saved because you did do something wrong. You came to church. <laughs> That's why you're here in the first That's why place. you came here, right? Because you had <laughs> sin. To get <laughs> so, yeah, they didn't want to talk about it at all because it's just I mean, it really is, let's think of a, about it as a hierarchy of respectability. Kathy Cohen again. She's the political scientist who studied the Black political response to AIDS. You know, the, the hierarchy, I think, had everything to do first with, do we respect this group? We supposedly care about children, so they're going to be higher up on this hierarchy. Um, and were their behaviors something that we might label as intentional in terms of leading to HIV and AIDS? Are you infecting Black communities and our respectability, right, as we seek to comport ourselves in a way um, that shows the world that we're deserving of equal rights? In her book, Kathy writes about a poster that someone was pasting up around the neighborhood in the mid-'80s. It asked, when will all the junkies die so the rest of us can go on living? It is this idea that, in fact, we can't live our lives, we can't be free, we can't have the mobilization that we deserve because those damn drug users threaten us. And they threaten us in multiple ways. They threaten us in terms of how we're represented, but at a kind of local level, they threaten us because, in fact, they might rob us for our money. And um, they might be my brother or my uncle or my second cousin who I am tired of. Um, and absolutely. I'm tired of you coming to mom and asking her for money. I'm tired of you stealing things. I'm tired. Absolutely. And I think that's part of how they land at the bottom uh, or near the bottom of the hierarchy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But to Pernessa Seal, the social worker at Harlem Hospital, the Black church had long been the first responders of caretaking in the community. And there just was no way we were going to confront this epidemic effectively as long as pastors trafficked in these ideas about who did and did not deserve care. So she decided to do something about it. Everybody told me to go to uh, Reverend Dr. Preston R. Washington's church, Memorial Baptist Church. And I went and I stood in this long line after church just to shake his hand. And when I got up to him, I said, uh, Dr. Washington, I am Pernessa Seal, and we are having a Harlem week of prayer for the healing of AIDS. I'll never forget it because we was me and the Lord. She managed to convince 50 faith institutions in the neighborhood to come together march around Harlem Hospital and pray for the healing of AIDS. It was the beginning of a ministry that carries on today that has converted one pastor after another into a welcoming rather than a damning force in the Black community. There are now thousands of Black faith institutions all around the world in Pernessa's coalition. And one of my strategies was not to mobilize the pulpit, but to mobilize the pew. Because I knew if I mobilized the pew, the pulpit would follow. I was Pernessa's trainer before there was a Harlem Week of Prayer. That's George Bellinger Jr. again, who was in that movement of queer artists who started pushing the community to face up to the epidemic in the mid-'80s. He went to work for a group that trained social workers at Harlem Hospital on how to deal with AIDS. He met Pernessa at a training. They became friends and collaborators. He says he knows the secret to her success with churches. The epidemic finally touched enough families that more and more mothers got tired of being judged when their kids got sick. And so so there were times where the mother's board had to pull a couple of pastors back and say, no, we're not having this conversation. You are not going to talk about my child. And if you continue to do that, this is one person's money you will not continue to get. Or not only my money, my support. And when Sister Mary stops coming to church and everybody's used to her sitting in the second row, you go, well, why should I come no more? And then she said, well, child, things are different. How important of a change do you think that made in the sweep of 
the black community's response to AIDS and as a consequence, the country's response to AIDS. It made it, it, made it palatable that it wasn't just taking care of the person that was impacted and died. It was also how their family was treated. It was also what services the mama needed. It changed the way people looked at each other. Matter of fact, I, I, a woman came to my office about two years ago, and she said, uh, you don't know me, but I was at your first Harlem Week of Prayer event. I said, really? She said, I was a funeral director. I said, really? And she said, did you do, did you know that all the funeral directors was at the first Harlem Week of Prayer? I said, no, I did not know that. She said, yes. She said, Reverend Dr. Wyatt T. Walker called all of us and mandated that every one of us come to that event because at that time, none of us were burying people with HIV and AIDS. And she said, you know, I, I cannot tell you how much repenting I do every day because I hate how I responded to AIDS back in the 80s and 90s. And she can't go back. She's in a different place today, but she cannot go back and fix it. I always remind people that there are two crises at the very least, right? There is the AIDS crisis and there's the Reagan crisis. Kathy Cohen says Black leadership from national civil rights groups on down to local pastors, they were all focused on a cascading set of problems. The crack epidemic, growing poverty, and a president who introduced the phrase welfare queen to our political vocabulary. This wasn't just a president. This was a president who came in with the agenda of really dismantling state support and using any additional state support to implement a kind of system of hyper-policing, of mass incarceration, of the demeaning and demolishing of Black communities. And I think very quickly Black leaders understood that they were under attack and Reagan was the focus of their attention. So here you have a community in which the most influential people in the most important institutions are feeling attacked by a distant, hostile government on one end and undermined by the vices of their neighbors and family members at the other end. And they carry that baggage into what has to be one of the most consequential debates of the epidemic. How to stop HIV from spreading through used needles one of the primary causes of new infections among Black and Latino people. So in 1986, uh, New York state officials proposed a pilot program of needle exchanges. And it was controversial. A needle exchange is a place where injection drug users can go to safely get rid of their used works and pick up clean needles instead. New York was one of 11 states in which it was illegal to have needles in your possession. And that's one reason that lots and lots of people shared the same needle. They were a scarce resource. HIV loved this fact. At one point, half of all injection drug users in New York City were HIV positive, almost entirely due to people sharing needles. So in 1986, the city health department decided to at least pilot an officially sanctioned needle exchange program. This was a huge victory. It was to be the first publicly run needle exchange in the country. Kathy Cohen says they were not ready for the pushback. Maybe for the people who could only see the positive aspects of this program, they weren't prepared for Black leaders to stand deeply in opposition to the needle exchange program. One of the pilot locations was to be in Harlem, which made perfect sense from an epidemiological standpoint. From a political standpoint, it could not have been a worse fit. Remember, the vibe in Harlem at the time was, pay me some damn respect and stop dumping all your problems here. So the fight was on. There were a range of reasons that people oppose needle exchange. Some looked historically and said, we've seen this before with Tuskegee, right, where uh, it's basically an experiment on Black people, and back then it was Black men and syphilis, right? Some people at a different extreme called it genocidal, that this was a way, in fact, to promote drug use in the Black community. And there were just kind of key people across the Black community that were opposed to this. 
So the first opposition came from people who, in a kind of paranoid way, thought that the virus was being shifted, you know, out of the white community into the black community. That wasn't former Governor David Patterson's objection, but he did oppose needle exchange. We, in my office, opposed the needle exchange for a different reason. We opposed the needle exchange because we thought that they were shifting one disease for another one. He felt like they should be worried about the problem of addiction itself, not how to manage around addiction. And that's an idea that Patterson and many other Black leaders had learned from a really influential doctor in Harlem, a guy named Benny Prim. So I started working very closely with the Centers for Disease Control on their advisory committee and with the Congressional Black Caucus. Benny died in 2015, having spent more than 60 years as a deeply respected voice in public health generally and among traditional Black leadership specifically. He was a national authority, including on AIDS. And I was chosen to go on President Reagan's Human Immunodeficiency Virus Epidemic Commission. But Dr. Prim did not like this needle exchange idea, which is interesting because his whole career had been built around standing up for drug users. There are no lobbyists for people who are dealing with with drug abuse, particularly in the African-American community. And I'm one of those lobbyists for that population. And I'm not going to give that up. Uh, He began his career at Harlem Hospital in the 1960s as an anesthesiologist in the emergency department. He noticed that 80 percent of all people coming into the ER were there for drug-related issues, which meant the ER was just constantly treating secondary problems, gunshot wounds, overdoses, and stuff like that, without touching the root, which was addiction. So Benny started researching addiction, and that put him in the middle of the community's debate over drug use for decades. But it's through those battles that he actually won a lot of respect from Black leadership. And that's also why they considered him a trusted source on how to deal with AIDS. But you know what? In addition to all that kind of stuff about his resume, people just really like Benny Prem. I mean, there was just something about him that grabbed you. Maybe it was the clothes. I rarely saw him wear the same thing twice, and I've had a relationship with him over 25 years. Dr. Larry Brown was Benny's protege in his addiction work. It was suit and tie, two-piece or three-piece, either a straight tie or a bow tie. He was always dressed so natally, right, with the salt and pepper mustache. This is Benny's daughter, Janine Prim Jones. She thinks part of her father's famous charm was that for a doctor in a three-piece suit, he was unexpectedly cool. He would talk about these cats, you know, in Harlem and hanging out with them. Um, You know, what it was like in Europe doing some translation for the modern jazz quartet, traveling around with them, and what a wild time that was. He could work a room with these stories. As a speaker... He was incredible. And he never talked down to people. I've always felt that Dr. Prem, more than many physicians, was a political being. He, in fact, understood the politics of how to get things done. By the 1980s, Benny had made real progress in his mission to focus everybody on addiction itself rather than the downstream problems that come from drug abuse. And then, suddenly a virus started killing people in his clinics. As always, his instinct was to engage. He had to look at how the gay guys were doing it downtown. My father started to see that the white gay community was not just acknowledging the deaths, because that's important, but also deciding that they had to do something about it. That was a provocation. He wanted to do the same thing for Black drug users in Harlem. And he wanted to learn from the gay activists. But Janine says he first had to confront some of his own demons. I think it was really hard for him. The Black community wasn't necessarily thinking about gay folks and what they do behind closed doors. The way that I know that my father was um, uncomfortable with it was that I have somebody very dear to me, and she started living with a woman. 
And my father realized that and he was afraid for me to be too influenced by the lesbian lifestyle that he didn't really want me to be with them anymore. And so he forbade me to visit them. And I did, I visited them secretly and um, he got used to it, but I think it was really hard for him. Janine feels like it was truly just a blind spot. Despite all of Benny's worldliness and suave, he was still a product of his generation and he just hadn't had enough exposure to out queer people. But of course, being the politically savvy charmer that he was, Benny never let on about any kind of discomfort he may have felt. I just got chills just thinking about Benny. Benny was such an amazing person. Phil Wilson was a young Black gay activist at the time. He was part of that cadre of queer activists from around the country who had begun pushing the community on AIDS. They'd branched out from talking to each other and connected with straight allies like Pranessa Seal and Benny Prim. I just remember being in this room in Washington, D.C., and there's all these queer folks and Benny. And Benny is there in his bow tie and his suit, you know, looking like, you know, the deacon at the church or the undertaker, all those (laughs) traditional, uh, traditional black male images. And all these queer folks, you know, and he was absolutely in it. You know, and I felt safe with him in the room. And it reminded me that our families cannot love us if they don't know us. And it reminded me that if we were going to be successful, that we had to introduce ourselves to our communities. We had to let them know that we were there. And we had to do it in a fashion that made it clear that we weren't asking to be a part of the community. We were a part of the community, full stop. Although Phil never noticed any hesitation from Benny Prem about sexuality, it was clear he did have a block when it came to the idea of needle exchange. When we got to you know, the issue around needle exchange and risk reduction in the drug user space, he was like, no. Because what he saw that as being is a way to exacerbate the problem um, in Black communities. Phil realized they had work to do with this hugely influential man. And so I began to just talk with Benny about his concerns and fears. And my leading point was our job was to, at a minimum, do triage. You know, that we had to figure out how to keep people alive until we could do better. And it worked. Dr. Prim moved to the needle exchange that it could be helpful, that it wasn't going to solve the whole problem, but we don't want to lose more people than we're losing and the and the death rate and, and the comparison of the death rate in the black community as opposed to the gay community or just the entire white community from this source was demonstrable. Benny Prim's shift in opinion about needle exchange was, without hyperbole, one of the more pivotal moments in the black political response to AIDS. It directly converted David Patterson and other leaders And more than that, it gave people like Phil and Pernessa Seal an opening on AIDS generally. Because he had a gravitas, you know, when we were talking with the folks at the NAACP and the Urban League and the Congressional Black Caucus and all of that. Those are his folks. You know, they were my parents, but those are his folks. So his gravitas made all the difference in the world. Needle exchange did eventually become legal in New York, and it would turn out to be one of the most effective HIV prevention tools in the history of the epidemic. But it took a long time to get there. Six years passed between the time the city first considered a pilot program in Harlem back in 1986 
And when drug users could finally go to a publicly funded spot and get clean needles. And that's kind of the story of this epidemic. Change that came too slow. And Phil Wilson argues it was probably not until after the turn of the century that the Black community really, truly mobilized. What do you think is the consequence of how long that took? I think the consequences of it is how many, how many of us died in the meantime. You know, that's the consequence. You know, had we been able to turn that tide earlier, you know, there are untold, you know, thousands, probably millions uh, of folks that um, might not have died. It is important to note that it did not have to be that way. I didn't want my brother Carlos to just be one more on a heap of a pile of people. And I also didn't want the community to just be unremembered. Next time on Blind Spot, we travel to the Bronx and meet someone who did not wait for permission to save lives with clean needles. Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows is a co-production of the History Channel and WNYC Studios in collaboration with The Nation magazine. Our team includes Emily Botin, Karen Frillman, Anna Gonzalez, Sophie Hurwitz, Lizzie Ratner, Christian Reedy, and myself, Kai Wright. Our advisors are Amanda Aronchik, Howard Gertler, Jenny Lawton, Marianne McCune, Yoruba Richin, and Linda Villarosa. Music and sound design by Jared Paul. Additional music by Isaac Jones. And additional engineering by Mike Kutchman. Our executive producers at the History Channel are Jesse Katz, Eli Lehrer, and Mike Stiller. Thanks to Miriam Bernard, Lauren Cooperman, Andy Lancet, and Kenya Young. I'm Kai Wright. You can also find me hosting Notes from America live on public radio stations each Sunday. Or check us out wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for listening. 